Hi, uh, welcome back. Um, so in this next um, series of lectures, we are going to study the matching model of the labor market. We are going to uh, describe it and study its properties. Um, before we start delving into the model, I think it's important um, to pause and try to think a little bit about what is a model and why we need models. Um, you must have seen uh, models in other econ classes um, as you went through um, your studies and uh, you must have seen models in other fields as well. But I think it's quite important to um, try to think about why, uh, why we use models and what uh, models mean. So um, I guess this goes back to the question of uh, what is um, science and what makes uh, a science as opposed to you know, something else. Um, so you can, uh, if you go on Canvas and look at the list of textbooks that I recommended, you will see two textbooks by, uh, of, by Thomas Kuhn. Uh, Thomas Kuhn was a historian of science and he is the one who really defined um, what makes uh, a science, what makes a science so special, why is science so effective at understanding, the, at understanding the world and also why science has made, has made so much progress in the past uh, century. So I highly recommend these books. Uh, one is called The Structure of um, Scientific Revolution. It's a shorter volume that summarizes um, all his research on different um, scientific revolutions. Um, and the other one is specific to the Copernican Revolution. This one is particularly interesting. Uh, it's a bit longer, but uh, these are very good reads. And if you're um, interested in uh, science in general, and if you want to know why the scientific enterprise was so successful, I highly recommend these books. But um, so if you read these books, you can see that is uh, Thomas Kuhn's perspective on science is that uh, what makes a science is two things. So first of all is that you have to pay attention to the real world around you. So there is an aspect of science that's a measurement of the real world, trying to collect data, trying to pay attention to the data, and always trying to um, look at what's happening in, in the real world. And the other part of a science um, is models or theories um, or groups of theories. Um, so science is really uh, science is really associated with these two things. One is that you have to pay attention to the data, you have to measure the real world, and two is that you have to develop models and theories. So these are usually mathematical uh, models and theories to try to understand uh, what you've observed in the real world. So it's really this interaction between data and models. Um, that, that makes a science and uh, that also explains why a science has been so uh, successful. Um, now, when you um, look at, uh, when you read Kuhn's book, then you can, try to, um, you can try to look at what he says about models. And in particular, it's, so this is very interesting, because um, in economics we talk about models and use models all the time, but there is no, we have, you know, people don't really think about what makes a good model and what makes uh, a model to be an effective scientific tool. Um, and so Kuhn um, isolates three aspects of uh, a model. So um, according to um, Kuhn, there are three things that are very important that makes a good uh, three things that are going to make a good model. So what are these things? So first of all, perhaps obviously, a model has to um, provide a good description of the world around you. So it has to be descriptive. Right. And usually, you know, people... Say, I mean, when, when you um, study economics, sometimes there's this idea that you come up with a model and then you try to test the prediction of the model. But that's silly. Um, 
you don't start writing a model until you've observed the real world around you. And the first task of a model is to be descriptive. That is, you're going to look at the real world, you're going to see what's going on, and then you want to build the model that describes what you know about the real world. Okay? Uh, so, if your model is not able to explain the basic phenomena that you're going to that you see in the real world, it, you know, it's not going to be an interesting model. So your model has to be descriptive. So now, if you think about uh, our matching model that we are going to introduce, when we want it to be descriptive, what do we want to be able to explain? And uh, well, we've talked quite a lot about the properties of the labor market in the previous lecture that we think are interesting and important. So as we are going to build a matching model, what are the things that we want to be able to describe? Well, first we want to be able to explain why there is unemployment. The fact that unemployment exists always, it's, it's a very persistent. So now you may think, well, that's completely obvious. But I mean, if you think about it, the basic model of the labor market in you know, neoclassical economics is a competitive model of the labor market. So it's a labor market in which supply is equal to demand and there is no unemployment. Anybody who wants to work is able to work at the given wage. So it totally fails to describe what we see in the real world. Okay? So although it seems obvious to have unemployment, it's actually not something that many models uh, have. So we want to have unemployment. Something that we've seen as well on the firm side is that in the same way that some workers are not able to find uh, jobs, firms are also not able to find workers immediately. So we want a model that's able to account for the presence of vacant jobs. Also exists. So we want a model that features, uh, that features this, uh, this property. Then we can uh, become a little bit more subtle. Something that we've also seen a key law that we observe is that unemployment rate and vacancy rate, they always move together. Uh, so I showed you data for the US, but that's true in many countries. And we said that there is always, uh, we consistently observe what we call the beverage curve. Beverage curve is this negative relationship that we observe uh, between the unemployment rate and the vacancy rate. So when the unemployment rate is high, the vacancy rate is low. When the vacancy rate uh, is high, the unemployment rate is low. And that seems to be something that we always observe on the labor market. So if we want our model to be descriptive, we need to be able to account for that beverage curve. Okay, and we'll see that the matching model is able to, uh, to do that. Then we saw a lot of other properties, uh, a lot of other facts about the labor market that we want to be able to capture. Uh, something that we saw as well is that uh, our unemployment is um, counter-cyclical. Uh, so that's something that we saw. So unemployment is high in bad times, is low in good times. We saw on the other hand that the vacancy rate is pro-cyclical. A lot of vacancies in good times, very few vacancies in bad times. We saw that the labor market tightness you know, if you're not, which is uh, the vacancy rate divided by the unemployment rate. Of course, if your unemployment rate is, is um, counter-cyclical, your vacancy rate is pro-cyclical, your labor market tightness will want it to be also uh, highly pro cyclical. Okay. Um, other things that we saw, we saw also the job finding rate moved, and we saw that it was much easier to find a job in um, good times than in bad times. We saw that for firms it was much easier to fill vacancies in bad times than in good times. So all these are facts that we we'll want to be able to account for. Okay? Because we want our model to be um, descriptive. These are things that we saw, we want to feature them in the matching model. So that's the first, uh, that's the first key uh, properties. The second properties that also play uh, a big role, according to Kuhn, is the fact that your model has to be economical.
So what does that mean? It means that your model has to be simple enough if you want, so economical in the sense of simple, um, that you can keep it in your head and always articulate what you see in the real world through the lens of the model. So it has to be a tool that's simple enough that you can use it to understand existing facts, you can use it when you're presented with new data, you can use it to analyze new problems. So it has to be a tool that's very simple to use. Now if you have a model with, you know, 50 equations and a complicated stochastic structure and you always have to put it in your machine to be able to know what your model tells you, this is really not economic and it's not something that you can use to understand the world, the world around you. So a good model has to be economical. It's something that you can keep in your head and use to uh, analyze things that you see. And we'll see that the matching model is very economical. Why? Because you'll see that it's very easy to represent the matching model through simple um, diagrams. And um, actually, the neoclassical model of the labor market, you know, a model with labor supply, labor demand, and market claim is very economical because you can represent it in a simple supply and demand diagram and your wage um, is found, you know, at the intersection of supply and demand. So we'll try to keep this simplicity in our matching model. So we'll have very simple diagram. We'll have diagrams with labor demand plus labor supply. And the demand and supply will have slightly different uh, interpretation as in the neoclassical model, but nevertheless we still have this, and then we have an equilibrium at the interception of uh, demand and supply. Okay, And so you can always keep these diagrams in your head and use them to understand what you see when you're presented with existing data, with new data, with new problems. Um, so that's something that's going to be another strong point of the matching model. And what is the last property that's very important according to Kuhn. Well, this one is a bit more sophisticated. Um, what makes a good model is that your model has to be a good guide to the unknown. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you need to be able to use your model to make predictions about the world, so to predict things that we haven't seen, and then use that to guide your empirical investigation of the real world. So one very famous example in Kuhn's um, work is the fact that um, once the Copernican model, you know, a model with the sun as a center, uh, as a center of you know, uh, the universe and then Earth rotating around the sun instead of having Earth at the center of the universe and the sun rotating around Earth. So once this heliocentric model became very, uh, you know, became accepted and became used by astronomers, uh, people were able to predict using the model um, the position of planets that were never seen before. And then using these predictions, you were able to use you know, the rudimentary telescope that people had at the time to try to see whether planets were actually where they were supposed to, uh, to be and new planets were discovered exactly that way. Um, and so here it's the same. With our matching model, we want to be able to use the model to make predictions that then we can go and explore um, using the data. Um, and you know, that's something you could do in your research project, for instance. You could use predictions of the matching model and try to see whether these are borne out by the data uh, or not. And in the case of the matching model, actually the model is very effective at doing that. So I can just give you um, two little examples from my own uh, research. Uh, so for instance, I use the matching model to show that uh, you know, the effect of public employment was much more beneficial in bad times than in, uh, than in good times. So if the government hires one worker, that has a much you know, stronger effect on the labor market in uh, bad times and in good times. And people have used that prediction, something that we have never, you know, we didn't know if it was true or not, but people have used that prediction to go and uh, look at the effect of government uh, employment. And it seems that indeed, government employment is more effective in bad times than in good times. So you can uh, go and measure employment multipliers to see, uh, to see that. So that's a place you know, where the model was uh, quite helpful. 
So another prediction that we'll talk about this semester that the model makes is that the model predicts actually that in bad times, if you help some workers to find a job, what's going to happen is that these workers are going to be more likely to find a job. So say if you help them write their CVs and prepare them for interviews, but that's going to be at the expense of other workers. So if you want in bad times, it looks like the number of jobs is almost fixed. So that if you help some workers, they're going to move ahead in the queue of job seekers and that's going to penalize other workers who are going to move down in the queue of job, of job seekers. This effect is much weaker in good times because in good times you have enough jobs for everybody. So that if some workers are helped, the other workers are not really suffering because there's just uh, a lot of jobs available. And that was something that's very specific to the matching model that wouldn't be predicted by other models. And people have been testing that prediction in, uh, in French data using randomized experiment and they found exactly that type of effect. So here again, it's a situation where the model was useful to guide empirical um, investigation. Uh, so they uh, basically they explored the effect of job cues and job training in good versus bad times. Okay, um, and so this, you know, this is a mark of a good model if you're able to um, to use it to guide your empirical investigation. Okay, um, so that's something that you should um, try to keep in mind when you study models. So to remember what makes uh, a good model, and that will allow you, um, you know, to understand even when you write your own models uh, what you should strive uh, strive for.